So uh, 15 minutes is not a lot of time, and I'm Canadian, so I tend to talk a lot. Uh, but then we apologize for it afterwards. <laughs> we tend to be okay. Uh, okay. Uh, F5, you said? There we go. Okay. Uh, my name is Amir Ahmed. Um, my colleague, Michael Carter, is uh, in the back there. Uh, and uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, inviting us to talk to you today. We're, we're pretty excited. Uh, about uh, just really introducing you to some of the work that we did uh, this past summer. I should also mention uh, that uh, Dr. Neil Ferris uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, he's our, our supervisor and kind of a, a point on this project. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you uh, something called sustainable archaeology um, and the work that Mike and I did uh, over the summer at sustainable archaeology uh, in 3D mass uh, digitizing of artifacts. Um, and that took us in a number of surprising directions um, that we'll talk about uh, right now. Uh, oh, that's us. That's, that's Neil on the top there. Uh, so sustainable archaeology is part of the uh, funding was given to sustainable archaeology by the Ontario government and innovation.ca. Uh, this is the facility here. It's a $10 million facility uh, that just went up this past uh, year. Um, and it was built to combat a, uh, a growing problem in southern Ontario, which is likely a problem in uh, Europe as well, um, which is archaeology is tied to land use development. Uh, so the more your population grows, uh, the more houses you need, the more archaeology you need, uh, and the more artifacts you end up with. Um, and in Ontario, there's no real uh, organized way to store all of these artifacts. So what you end up with is a situation where artifacts are stored in uh, boxes in people's basements, in attics. You know there are stories of you know an archaeologist will die and their spouse will take those artifacts and pave their driveway with it, not knowing what it is. It's really really awful stuff. So this is what that kind of looks like. It's a mess of cardboard boxes. It's just it's just awful. So. Uh, Neil, Dr. Neil Ferris and his uh, uh, principal, uh, co-principal investigator, uh, Avi Cannon from MAC, want to turn this into this, uh, which is an organized system to grab all the artifacts uh, that is being produced by the CRM industry uh, in Ontario and to compile it all under one roof uh, in one facility. Uh, so this is the Sustainable Archaeology Facility uh, at Western U. Um, so what that lets you do, once you, once you sort of put together a system and a workflow to start bringing in artifacts under one roof, you can make all of those artifacts available and accessible to people. Uh, and that's part of, that's a core part of the sustainable archaeology vision, uh, is accessibility through uh, digitizing. Um, and it's great to, kind of hear all the other talks because uh, a lot of that stuff is really uh, sort of where we're heading. Um, and in Southern Ontario, uh, not a lot of people are doing this. So, you know, I feel kind of like, you know, uh, I'm, this is my tribe because nobody <laughs> else, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, okay, so let me just uh, quickly take you through uh, the process of an artifact going from uh, a big to uh, storage. So uh, basically, uh, an excavation, somebody pulls out an artifact, and they're processing it, they put it in a bag, they put it in one of our, our plastic green boxes, uh, which isn't going to degrade over time. Uh, they put a, a tag on it, a DM code, so we, so we know where it comes from. They send it over to us, and at that point, one of two things happens. Um, it's either put away in storage, so on one of those shelves, or it goes through more intense uh, digitizing process. So artifacts that are um, uh, diagnostic, uh, otherwise complete, or just really interesting, uh, go to the Sustainable Archaeology Animation Unit. Um, Mike and I both have a computer animation, uh, computer animation background. Mike is an 18-year uh, TV industry uh, and uh, film and television, CGI, special effects industry uh, veteran. Um, I used to be a storyboard artist, um, so we're coming at this as sort of a, a media creation uh, 
perspective. So this past summer, we, oh, and these are some of our sponsors. Uh, we were able to give about thirty thousand dollars for our, our, our pilot project. Um, so this past summer, we pulled uh, ten computer animation interns uh, from Loyalist College in Southern Ontario, second year and third year. So they had a bit of a technical background behind them, um, and so we pulled them uh, into the SA uh, with the task of figuring out a system for three D digitizing. That was it. So these are our uh, uh, 3D3 white light scanners uh, that we used. Uh, we have four of them. Oh, that's better. Um, we have four of them. And uh, we spent about, I would say, a uh, better part of a month figuring out how to get these uh, operational. Um, but once we did, we uh, set an amount of time for ourselves. We said, OK, we're going to give us ourselves three weeks, and we're going to scan as many artifacts as we possibly can. Uh, so we were able to scan uh, just under 400 artifacts in three weeks. So, which we think is probably you know where we need to be in order to uh, fill our database full of uh, digitized artifacts. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. Uh, yeah, so we start with a. a the artifact, we get a, a model, then we apply some high res uh, textures uh, on top of it. The scanning process is actually relatively fast. Um, if it's a complex artifact, uh, then it could take uh, probably about 20 minutes uh, to do 100 individual scans, um, but probably no more than that. So the entire process, including scanning, hole filling, uh, post processing, Probably takes about an hour and an hour and a, to, an, to an hour and a half for uh, more complicated artifacts. Uh, simpler, uh, more straightforward artifacts can be done in about half an hour. So, uh, even though we we did we were working at a rate of about six or seven per day, depending on the artifact, you can increase that by double. Um, so once we had this as a um, a digital version of an artifact, we, we kind of started to think about. Where are we going to go next? So at this point, we, we stole a, uh, a term that we got from game design, uh, which is digital asset. So this is a virtual artifact. It's a digital asset. Now we can kind of take it and point it to another, a number of directions. Um, and we had, you know, we had computer animation students who so were like, well, let's let's make a, an animation. Um, so we start off with this. This is a uh, one of our artifacts. So this is an an actual 3D model of a, a, a scanned artifact with high resolution textures on it. And that was done fairly quickly, so we, we moved on uh, to something more interesting. This is the, the end of a longhouse. And so we decided to animate shingles going on to the longhouse. Um, we're associated with a museum, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology in London. And uh, they need teaching resources. So they asked us to develop a flyover. Uh, once they saw this stuff, they asked us to uh, develop a flyover of a uh, 15th century native village uh, called the Lawson Site, which is behind the, uh, the museum. Um, so we spent some time to do that. And this is it here. This is kind of a lower resolution version. Um, so what we wanted to do was actually animate uh, very specific things. So things like a longhouse being built, um, the palisade going up, um, what that environment may have looked like, uh, the interior of the longhouse. What's interesting about this is that uh, a lot of the objects in the longhouse are actual artifacts. So it, it, there's a direct connection between digitization and media. Done. So, and you know, the internship was 14 weeks. Uh, and at this point, we we're about halfway through, so we're like, well, what are we going to do now? So, we decided to put it into a game. Oh, that's footsteps. That's funny, I didn't know that was there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like someone's knocking on the ceiling. Uh, so, we took all those digital assets and we brought it into the Unreal Engine. Um, and this is going to go uh, on a kiosk in. Uh, uh, in the museum. Uh, so right now, uh, the user is actually going through this. 
Those little green uh, leafy things are information nodes. So I presented this to uh, a high school. And uh, it was a talk about digital archaeology. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. You're not going to see this, but when you try, you actually see robot legs. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I was presenting this to a, a class, uh, and the talk was about digital archaeology uh, and uh, uh, archaeology in general, and I showed this to them, and, and the, the, it, was, it was done. Like, the talk was over. I, they pushed me off, and they just, like, played with this for about half an hour. So it really shows you how effective this, using this type of media can be to engage with the public um, or archaeology. I'm just going to move on here. Okay, the other thing that we looked at was. Can you see that? Okay, it's kind of dark, but okay. The other thing we looked at was. Right now? It's a big box, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. That might be. Sorry, yeah. You want to break everything? Am I losing time right now? Yeah, that way. Perfect. Yeah. You happy now, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just got from that. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. I'm just this disembodied voice talking. So, this, uh, how many people are familiar with Minecraft? Okay, good. Good. That's more than I thought, actually. So, uh, we created the Unreal Engine. Uh, sorry, we didn't create the Unreal Engine. We created the game that we put into the Unreal Engine. Uh, and we started to sort of think about uh, ways that we could push that. What else can we do in these kinds of environments. So uh, I asked one of the interns to start building something in Minecraft, uh, and they started doing this. So uh, for those of you not familiar with Minecraft, um, it's essentially digital lingo. Um, so it lets you create things, it lets you build things digitally, but things also have real world physics. Uh, you can interact in really surprising ways. Um, so we thought it would be neat to kind of set, so right now that's the Palisade, uh, we thought it would be really cool to kind of see what happens if we set this on fire digitally. Uh, and we couldn't get it working. And we're like, why is this thing not setting on fire? And we were like, wait a second, it's raining. So it, it, you know, it, showed, it, it goes to show that there's a real kind of direct connection between uh, uh, real world, world physics and uh, something that you can build to um, uh, engage with the public, which is something that I don't think uh, has ever been explored before. So, those are some of the things that we were, were working on uh, this past summer. Um, so, Mike, have I forgotten anything? I feel like I might have. You no, shaved it. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, at that point, we're, at this point, we were kind of like, well, where are we going to go next? Um, and the title of this talk is The Internet of Things Digital Artifact Ecosystems, um, because we, uh, uh, we should have had this already, but we don't have it yet. But we're getting a 3D printer uh, at uh, Sustainable Archaeology that should be here uh, probably in a month or so. And so we realized that once we had a digital asset, we could then print out these artifacts. right? So once we print them out, you can do a lot of things with them. Uh, so just a word about the Internet of Things. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what that means? OK. All right, good. So let, let's go over it really quick. So the Internet, of, the Internet of Things was a concept that came about in the, in the late 90s. Uh, and it, it basically describes a way for uh, computer systems to talk to real things. So the original idea was to use RFID tags uh, for that to happen. Um, and that was 13 or so years ago. So essentially in 1999, uh, that was just for really inventory purposes. Um, so we're at Internet of Things 2.0, maybe even 3.0, um, where it's more than just inventory. So uh, as sustainable archaeology, we're certainly doing inventory. Uh, all of our boxes are RFID tags, so we know where they go within the facility. Uh, all of our, all of our um, artifacts will have DM codes uh, attached to the artifact in some way, so you can scan it and get information. But where else can you? But this technology, what else can you do with it? So we thought it would be perfect for um, public digital engagement. So let me just um, uh, run you through a scenario um, that we've played around with. Um, let's say, for example, at the museum, you print off um, a bunch of digital artifacts, each 
uh, artifact is unique and you give one to uh, a student. Each artifact has uh, a DM code on it or an RFID tag or maybe uh, an, uh, an NFC sticker on it, um, which means that you can interact with other systems. So that artifact is theirs for life. Now let's say that they take that artifact and they go to another museum and this additional museum has uh, a display that can read that artifact. So what we are thinking is that it could look something like this. So what this is, is this is your artifact. This is your digital recreation that you've taken to say, you know, the British Museum. You've taken it to a display of uh, an artifact from Egypt. And you go, beep, you check in. And this display comes up with your artifact on a timeline and compared to uh, the artifact that you checked in at on the same timeline. Uh, and information in the middle which compares the two. So what that means is this is contextual information. Uh, it's unique to you and your artifact. So every time you take your artifact and check it into a display, that experience is different because your artifact is yours and the information attached to your artifact is yours. So we think that's quite cool because what that means is you're interacting with uh, the archaeological record uh, in a very unique, very personal way. It means that artifacts can live uh, multiple lives. Uh, artifacts can, uh, aren't tied to uh, uh, geographic restrictions. In southern Ontario, we tend to think of archaeology just as southern Ontario. You know, now you can take your Paleo Indian point to Arkansas, check it in there, and compare it along whatever this timeline might be, uh, and figure out points of similarities, how they differ. Uh, I should say that this is just one uh, example. You know, once you start creating data that's completely open, um, uh, uh, Adam talked about. Uh, is that right? Okay, perfect. So Adam talked about um, uh, the history of London in ten. Uh, artifacts. Um, I know the British Museum has history of the world in 100, so imagine if each one of those was 3D printed. Now you can interact with this stuff in a very, very unique way. Uh, but it, it all depends on creating an open framework to support this. Um, and from our perspective, that starts with <coughs> mass object digitization and uh, that next step, which is that media creation part. Um, so that's why we're kind of excited to be here because we think this is a good opportunity to start talking to people about how we can make this happen because we think this is actually quite worth it. Um, so let me just end up by saying that. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so let me end up by saying that uh, uh, in Canada, um, impersonations of people have told archaeologists that artifacts uh, have voices have essentially spirits. So what we want to do is we want to take those spirits and voices and make them accessible for everybody. Thank you.